Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 4. We're back in the Acts series. It's been like two months. And uh, right before, uh, or right after Acts 3, Pastor Brandon preached on Acts 3, I went into Signs of the End Times. And so, and then we had Christmas. So I wanna give you a quick recap. And today's message is entitled, Spirit-Empowered Witnessing. Spirit-Empowered Witnessing. I believe your life is a witness in itself when you've been changed by Jesus. And I'm praying this, I've been praying this, that, that you will see yourself as a witness, someone who can testify to the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ in your life. Uh, please do me a favor, don't look down upon your testimony or minimize what God has done in your life. I was born and raised in the church, so I don't have that kind of testimony where I went down this like really dark path and everything. You know, and sometimes you can look down on that and go, I guess I don't have a great of a testimony as some people who've been through a lot of stuff. But the reality is, is that God has also kept me from a lot of stuff. And so that's a testimony in itself too. It's another way of looking at it. And I just wanna encourage you that you can be a testimony more than you realize. So I pray today's message helps you with that. Uh, Peter and John were going to a prayer service and they healed a, a lame man. And that man's healing prompted the opportunity for them to teach who Jesus is and that he was healed in the name of Jesus or in the power of Jesus Christ. And who would have thought this would cause a bunch of drama, but it did. You know, like helping someone who's been lame for 40 years and it causes drama, that seems kind of wrong, doesn't it? So that's what we're going to read about today in Acts chapter 4. I'll read some, I'll teach some, I'll read and teach and we'll get through it and then we'll do some takeaways for us to apply to our lives. Acts chapter 4 verse 1, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, because they were preaching the gospel after this healing, they were confronted by the priests and the captain of the temple guard and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it, so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. Now, okay, let me explain to you what's going on here. The Jews had like this this supreme court, religious supreme court called the Sanhedrin. And they were made up of two groups, Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Sadducees did not believe that there would be a resurrection of the dead. Okay, but they're all disturbed because they just crucified Jesus. And now these apostles or these men, the ones that followed Jesus are going around saying, there, there is a resurrection of the dead and Jesus is alive. Can you imagine getting arrested for that? Like, imagine if I go out today to, I don't know, Redner's, and I start telling people Jesus is alive, and I get cuffs on me, and I, you know, like, that's weird. Like, but that's what they were dealing with here, and it wasn't necessarily the Roman government at all. It was the Jewish leadership, okay, the religious leadership. And it's interesting, like their, their doctrine, their dogma was so strong that they missed the miracle and they missed Jesus. Don't ever let your religious roots make you miss Jesus. Because that happened a lot. So if you were raised in some way or form, make sure your faith is centered on Jesus, not religious tradition. Okay? And the result of this was 2,000 more people. So a total of 5,000 now have been saved since Acts 2, all right? And that doesn't even include the, the women or children, all right? This is, they only counted men at this time, and then their households weren't totaled in the tally. So there's a lot of people getting saved because of this miracle and Peter and John preaching the gospel. And now they're in trouble for it. It's so odd to me. 
But the next day, the council of all the rulers, verse five, and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, the big dogs come in. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, say filled, filled. with the Holy Spirit, said to them, how many know we need the Holy Spirit to help us in times like this? Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. The man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is, no, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Now, can I have some creative licensing a little bit on this? Let me add a little creativity in this. Can you imagine Peter and John, they're getting questioned by this Supreme Court of religious leaders. There's about 70 there. And let me show you some pictures real quick of what this might have looked like back then. I have a few to show you of what it could have been in Solomon's colonnade. This is where it took place. So it was in the temple and it was like these columns that were down uh, around the whole building, but there was a certain side that they were in and it was like Solomon's porch is what it's called. And you can go to another one and show them what it looked like in today, okay? Or what it looked like back then as well. So you have these, these columns and they were teaching the people and there was a large crowd of people all because this man was healed. And now they're arrested, it's the next day, and they're being challenged. And you would think that Peter and John, if they had to get out of this situation, maybe they would you know, digress and hold back some of the strong things they said. Did they do that? No. No, because the Holy Spirit gave them the words to say. The Holy Spirit gave them the courage to do what they needed to do. And can you imagine John next to Peter? What if he was like this? What if John was like, hey, uh, Peter, what are you doing, man? <laughs> uh, these are the same people that killed Jesus, you know? But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. Instead, they both boldly stood there before, the, uh, before them and before the Lord and testified of the truth. Simple as that. There is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved except through the name of Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus that healed this man. It was the power of Jesus that healed this man. Now imagine the man healed. He's standing over here like, yep, I'm, I'm the one that just got healed. I'm just the miracle. Okay, they're the ones saying those things, okay? No. <laughs> I'm just the miracle. But yeah, I'm I'm standing. After 40 years, I'm here. Praise God for that. Amen. They quote, Peter quotes Psalm 118 about the, the stone being rejected and now he's become the cornerstone. That was referring to Israel. It was uh, looking back at Israel and how small Israel is. And remember I showed you that slide of how small Israel is next to all the nations around it even today? It is small, isn't it? It's insignificant. And they looked at Jesus as insignificant, but he wasn't in God's eyes. And God elevated Jesus, God glorified Jesus, and he became the cornerstone, not just a pebble, but a cornerstone that holds buildings together in real life at this time. Without the cornerstone, they weren't able to build properly. Jesus became the cornerstone or the capstone so that everything could be built properly. Are you following me? So Jesus is not insignificant. He is everything that matters right now. He, he is the one that you've been looking for. That's what Peter is saying to them. He's like, he's the one. He's the one you've been looking for in the Torah, in the Old Testament, in the prophets. He's the one. And they hadn't believed that yet. So this is why they're coming against Peter and John, all right? But I believe they're really coming against Jesus. 
So let's, let's look into this more. Verse 13, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Isn't that awesome? What kind of reputation do you want? I want that kind of reputation. That man's been with Jesus this week, or that man's been with Jesus. That man's walked with Jesus. That man's been fellowshipping with Jesus. Jesus must be his friend. And they were amazed. And I got, I got to tell you this, like, this is something that really hit me in this story, that you would think the same people who had Jesus crucified, even though he was innocent, you would think that their response would be much worse right here. But I believe that when the Holy Spirit uses you, he helps things, even truth like this, land on ears better, like gracefully. And I believe the Holy Spirit helped this hard truth, this difficult truth to grasp, that you killed Jesus. You killed the cornerstone that we've been waiting for. He, the Holy Spirit made it um, palatable, made that truth edible, made that truth acceptable, into the way, in the way of this, in this way. They didn't kill Peter and John in that moment. Because why would they do anything differently? They just got rid of Jesus. Why wouldn't they sentence them? So I'm getting ahead because I didn't even read that part. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, let's go to verse 14. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. Remember that guy? He's over here like, hey, yep. Used to be on the ground for 40 years and now I'm standing here in front of you. <laughs> Verse 15, so they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. See, they got a problem with Jesus, don't they? So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. You know, that's all the enemy has is threats. That's all he has. And the enemy doesn't like Jesus because God glorified Jesus. God is using Jesus. God is using Jesus to save mankind from their sin. Verse 19, but Peter and John replied, <laughs> and this, again, this is their chance to go, okay, we're good. We're not gonna get crucified. We should go, right? I, we should probably bow out, you know, maybe not even say anything. We'll just keep doing what we wanna do. Don't even say anything. You know, less is more. I'm not gonna poke the bear. Nope. Sometimes the Holy Spirit wants you to say the hard things too. Verse 20, we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. I think that's, wow. We cannot stop telling everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a line. I'm, I'm my apologies. Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? That's an important line, isn't it? <laughs> do you think that God wants us to obey you rather than him? That's an easy, easy answer for us, isn't it? Obey God, not man. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. I mean, this is their identity. They've spent three and a half years. They're apostles. They're sent ones. They're ambassadors for Jesus. They're like Jesus. They're not Jesus, but they are more like him than they ever have been before. It, it would be like telling me not to preach today because I got to be quiet because I'm talking about Jesus and the hope that he has for everyone. Can you imagine someone telling me not to talk about Jesus and what he can do? No, I, I would never stop. I'll never stop talking about what Jesus has done. Amen. I'll never stop because I've seen him work. I've seen him move. I know he's real. They're not gonna stop. That would be to dishonor God. They're not gonna be silent. 
they're going to speak up. Praise God. Let me continue then. Verse 21, the council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot for everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. Wow. How do we apply this to our lives? Because there isn't a Jewish religious Sanhedrin on the corner you know, or at this church trying to stop us from preaching outside, although there may be one day a radical group that when you pull in the Calvary, they're trying to scourge you from coming here. That could be a reality. And there could be people trying to silence me to preach the gospel from, from preaching the gospel. That could be the reality in the future, but it's not the reality right now. So I want to encourage us with this, and I, I want to... I looked at the scripture and I said, God, what do you need me to say? And the first thing that I got was from the scripture and just confirmation from being with him is God wants us to witness out of fellowship or abiding with him. Let me explain that. They were together in prayer and the Holy Spirit filled them. Remember Peter said all these things because the spirit filled him to say it? Okay, they were in fellowship together and they were going to prayer when they went to heal the man and they're living by the spirit. They're living with the spirit in them. And so I believe that God wants us to witness from a place of abiding or fellowshipping with him in our personal time and with the church. So when we leave today, we could be or should be empowered or step out and trust that the Holy Spirit is with us to be a witness. Now, here's what happened. Since they were with Jesus before he died, and then he rose again and was with them for 40 days, and then he sent his spirit, since then, they have been witnessing and people are getting saved. They've been doing healings. They have been facing opposition and answering really well. And so they are being a witness from a fellowship with God. Why do I say that? Because I, I have seen even in my own life or even in believers' lives that the further we are away from God as Christians, the less likely we're gonna see what God sees. The less likely we're gonna feel how God feels about a man on the ground for 40 years. You see, they were in fellowship with the Lord. They were spending time. For today, it would be reading our Bible, praying, being at church, they were hanging out with God and when they would leave that moment and they would go do life on mission, they saw things that God would see. They saw things that Jesus would see. They felt things that Jesus would feel. Are you following me? And if we're not in fellowship with God and we're kind of doing life on our own and we're not reading our word and we're not praying and we're not spending time with him, we're more likely gonna focus on who? Ourselves. So, and I'm right there with you, my friends. I'm in the same camp. If I don't spend time with the Lord on a daily basis, I can get off. I can start worried about the dumbest things in my life and be afraid of things I was never afraid of. And I could get focused on the wrong things in life and get more religious instead of be more like Jesus. And I want more Jesus when I come here, not just more church. You know what I mean? And I want to be like Jesus when I leave, not just here at church. And so I say, we need a fellowship with him. And so I'm back to your New Year's resolution. We need to abide or be in fellowship, spiritual fellowship with the Lord so that we'll live like the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, here's the thing about that. There does come a time where we got to make a decision. We got to make a decision to live on mission for Jesus and not live for our own mission. Because Peter and John are just like us. They, were, they have testimonies of Jesus. They've been changed by Jesus. We believe Jesus has risen again. They did too because they saw him. We believe with faith because we weren't there, but we have physical evidence. We have testimonies of a changed church, all those things, okay? But we personally have been following Jesus and we have to make a decision 
to be on mission every day. And that's the hardest part, isn't it? And that's why we really have to stay in tune with God so he can remind us, you're a kingdom person too. You're a kingdom citizen. I've saved you for such a time as this. I've equipped you with my Holy Spirit so you can make a difference in your workplace today. Don't just live for your personal ambition. Live, first of all, for my mission. We do have to make a choice to that. And when we do, we will begin to see the way Jesus sees people. Secondly, if we're going to learn from this scripture, I see that they presented the gospel in every way possible. They did everything they could. You know what, they, what primed this whole moment? What primed this moment is they were going to a prayer meeting, they were living on mission, and they prayed for a man to be healed in Jesus' name. That prompted a response for all the people who had questions. How many know that you can do a good deed or a miracle this week in someone's life, supernaturally or even naturally, be a blessing to someone, and it causes a conversation in your workplace or your neighborhood or in your family. And God wants to use that. The second thing they were living like is they were living like Jesus. We can live like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. And remember what I taught last week in um, John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But also this, when we're in fellowship with Jesus, we'll look more like Jesus to people outside in the world. Have you ever had anyone come up to you and go, you are different. There's something different about you. And why are you always smiling? How are you happy right now? Aren't you upset that line took an hour? You know, whatever it may be. I'm not talking about the DMV, but I may. <laughs> See, the gospel preaches without words too. Demeanor, resemblance. So you have good deeds or miracles. You have how you carry yourself. And the last thing they did is they talked about the gospel. They shared the gospel. Now, okay, you ready? All right, listen. We can't use the excuse that we didn't go to Bible college. We can't. Here's why. Everything Peter and John said is in scripture. I can read the story of Jesus' life and go say the same thing they said. The script is in there. The script is the scripture. Ooh, write that down. Save that one. Oh, it's there. But it's not just that. It's what Jesus has done in your life. Because they witnessed these things. They heard They saw, and so they can't stop talking about Jesus. We don't have an excuse. We have 2,000 years of Jesus saving people's lives. We have the whole Bible now. We have the whole Bible. They didn't have any Bibles in print yet except for the Old Testament on scrolls and papyrus paper or whatever that was, animal skins. We have numerous Bibles in our house that tell us why Jesus came and what he accomplished for your neighbor, for your coworker. We have no excuse. And I would say that the more we're hanging out with Jesus, the more we'll see that our life is meant to be on mission and the more we'll study the scriptures to share this good news. Amen? Amen. 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 I told you I was gonna challenge you, but I believe you can do this. I believe you can. And, and remember this, it's, it's not just what you say, it's how you live. You see, they noticed that they had been with Jesus. I think that, I, and although they killed Jesus, I think the way they handled themselves, they were so amazed and God worked in their hearts that it quelled any violence against Peter and John and they were thinking about what they've been seeing. And I believe God does that today when we talk to people about Jesus. And one of the reasons why is because the way you live. It makes the gospel attractive. So let's continue to be like that. Share the gospel in every possible way. All right. 
Now, do we need to say this? We do have to teach or say the Bible. We do have to teach the gospel or talk about it, explain it to people. So we do need to study it. Are you following me on that? All right. Because I know there's a quote by uh, St. Augustine that says, uh, share the gospel and, and if necessary, use words. Um, it's necessary. <laughs> it is. But I believe that. I, I think he's right. I think you got to live like Jesus, make it attractive. But we're living in a post-Christian, post-biblical world. They don't know the story of Jesus. So we're going to have to get it out of our mouths and say, this is what Jesus did. And you don't have to make it sound really pretty. Peter and John didn't do that either. Okay. All right, let me move on. All right. Thirdly, we need to expect spiritual warfare, but don't let it keep you from being a bold witness. Now, I put this, I, will, I almost just said, expect spiritual warfare, but I didn't want to scare anyone away from being a bold witness. But the reality is, um, and, and here's why. Some of us have been through so much stuff, the last thing we want is more opposition. I feel you, I know. But it's the Holy Spirit that helped Peter and John do this, all right? And people are worth going through the opposition. People's souls and the reality of heaven and hell is worth going through the opposition. And the Lord will give you the boldness even in the face of opposition. It didn't take long for the devil to show his hand it's already right there in Acts chapter four at the beginning of this book. The devil didn't like what was going on and how the church was spreading and how Jesus was being glorified. So now he's using these people to fight against the gospel. Expect that, but expect victory as well. Let me share why. Because God loves planting seeds in storms too. Yes. Yeah, but you, uh, you, maybe you haven't planted grass in your backyard. Probably not a good idea to do it with winds. It's going to land on your pavement. It's going to land on sidewalks. It's going to land everywhere else. It's not going to land where you want it to be. Let me tell you something. God can use a storm to get to the enemies of the gospel. God can use a trial like this. God can use opposition to plant seeds of the gospel. He did. As we read through the, the book of Acts and study it, these people who were against them end up getting saved. It's because of this trial that God began to save some of these Pharisees and Sadducees, these leading priests. It's because of this trial. It's because God sovereignly put them in this trial so that the gospel wouldn't go just to the crowd in, the, in Solomon's colonnade, but the crowd or the gospel would go to the enemies of the gospel. God cares about the religious people of this world. God cares and he cared about the Pharisees and Sadducees and that they would be saved. So God allowed Peter and John to go through this trial so that he would be glorified and they would believe. I promise you, when we read through Acts, you're gonna see that some of them are getting saved because God loves his enemies too. And he says, pray for them and to bless them and not curse them. So God wants to use us with people who can't stand religion or stand, can't stand Jesus, can't stand Christianity. Do you know that God wants them saved too? His heart is that big for them that he will allow us to go through things like that. In fact, right now, we have missionaries in some of the hardest places in the world dying to get these seeds planted in people's hearts and they will not return void because the Bible does not return void. People will be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I thank God for men and women, the men like Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. In the face of hate and opposition, he stood up for what's right. He was a biblical man, a godly man. He was driven by the gospel that Jesus came for all and died for all so that all may be saved. I thank God for that because it's impacted even my own family members. 
It's impacted this church. A man that wasn't afraid to stand up and speak the truth. Thank God for that. And all the people he influenced as well. Thank God for that. He's made a difference in our nation. And lastly, and by the way, I'm sure he expected spiritual warfare too. (laughs) I'm sure he expected it. But he kept going. And he gave his life for it. Lastly, this should encourage us all. The Holy Spirit witnesses with us. The Holy Spirit is witnessing, witnessing with you. You know, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to be with the disciples. Let me show you the scripture in John chapter 14. I uh, saved it for the end, but I had it in the wrong place in my outline. John 14, uh, 15 through 17 in verse 26. Jesus is with the disciples and he says this, and it should be on the screen for you as well. If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. And, and the Amplified Version puts the brackets in the parentheses, comforter, uh, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby. That's everything Jesus gives, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit gives us. All those things. He is all those things to us. To be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive and take to its heart because it does not see him or know him, at least not yet, okay? But you know him because he, the Holy Spirit, remains with you continually and will be in you. But the helper, also known as the comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent everything that I have told you, or to represent me on, act on uh, sorry, I got lost there, to represent me and act on my behalf, he will teach you all things and he will help you remember everything that I have told you. Wow. Let me um, fix some of that because I, I lost my place. The Greek word is paraclete and it means to come alongside. But what it means is, is Jesus alongside you. So we may not have walked with Jesus for three and a half years, but I don't know how long you've been saved, but you've had the Holy Spirit or the presence of Jesus with you that long. And he is here and he is with you and now he lives inside of you because of salvation. See, at the time, the world wasn't seeking the Holy Spirit. The world didn't even know yet. It wasn't until Acts 2 that the world would would, uh, know about the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus living inside of us. Isn't that awesome? And through salvation, we have the paraclete. We have the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the advocate, the comforter, the teacher. So you're not alone in this journey. He's gonna give you the words to say. He's gonna lead and guide you. I know he's doing that already. Let me share with you what what Mari Scarborough would do. Man, that hurts. I mean, every loss here hurts. But to get a call or text that he's in the hospital Monday and then he's, he has passed and gone on to glory by Friday, that's tough. That didn't give us much time to brace ourselves. But you know what he did? And I want his daughter to know this too. And I can't remember if he drove for Uber or for Lyft. Both, both. Do you know what he did? He would share the good news of Jesus for that entire ride with whoever got in that car. Yeah. And who knows, maybe, maybe he only got one star because of that. Maybe his reviews went down. He didn't care. Because not everyone's gonna accept, not everyone's gonna agree. But he shined Jesus in that car every time. He showed them what Jesus' love looks like. I thank God for men of God like that. I'm gonna miss him. Every Sunday, he would encourage me. Every Sunday. He would just say, keep going, brother. I love what God's doing through you. I love what God's doing to this church. It's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt to not hear that. It's gonna hurt to not have our families that are moving on. But you know what? God always knows how to fill in the gaps. Fill in the gaps and bring another. Amen. 
We can be witnesses because you're not alone in this. The very presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit is with you. Here's what I've learned. If we step out in faith and believe the Bible for what it says, you will find out it's true. You will find out that he will give you the words to say. He will use things that you never expected to share the gospel or to share your life. And people are watching you. So be careful. Be careful to lead them to the truth of Jesus Christ. Can we stand together and we're gonna pray for a moment. Because we don't wanna miss something here. The miracle still is reverberating into chapter four. They were healed in Jesus' name. Not Ryan's prayer, not your name, not my name, but he was healed by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And so the Lord has prompted me to this morning to just, with childlike faith, just pray for healings today. And uh, we're also gonna have the prayer team come up if you need further prayer for anything. Because there's another thing that you wanna consider, and that is your relationship with Jesus. It's one thing to be physically healed, but the more important thing is to be spiritually healed. It's to be forgiven of your sins and to be given eternal life. That's the good news. The bad news is sin leads to death and we all have sinned. The good news, the gospel is that Jesus obeyed God. Jesus willingly died on the cross for us and his death leads us to eternal life. His death on the cross defeats sin and his resurrection defeats death. And all who believe in Jesus Christ are forgiven of their sins and are given everlasting eternal life. And even right now, you're changed. You're a new creation, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Created to do good works in advance that have already been planned for you in in advance long ago. He's ready to transform your life completely. So if that's you, we're ready to pray with you down here. Ready to, to, to be with you, to help you on this journey as well. But today, I just wanna simply pray as well for this. If you need a physical healing, you've been praying for a physical healing in your body, we wanna pray today in Jesus' name. Believe in what we see and what we've read here today. So if you've been praying for something for quite some time, maybe something new, maybe you got a new diagnosis, maybe the doctor gave you some bad news this week, would you raise your hand for a moment? Okay, if you see a hand up, if it's okay with you, can we place hands on your shoulder just to pray with you? So if you have your hands up, keep your hand up for me. We're gonna pray for you. <clears throat> and we're gonna pray for a little boy named Caden. Caden is fighting cancer again. They have found more spots. He's five years old. And God has been bringing him through, but we're just believing that he can continue to bring him through or just a miracle. Just wipe out all the cancer, restore everything. So let's just begin to pray right now. We thank you, God. Pray for those people around you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. You're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And we come to you, Lord, for these needs in this room, online as well. For little Caden, Lord, as he prepares for more chemotherapy. God, We believe in miracles. We believe in the name of Jesus Christ for salvation and for healing. And we ask God, those hands that are raised for our five-year-old Caden, for others not represented here today, we pray, God, that you would glorify your son once again, that you would be glorified because we ask for a miracle healing today in Jesus' name. Let it be done in this moment right now, Lord. Thank you, God, for the faith you've given us. Thank you for the testimonies of saved lives, of healed lives, Lord. And I pray, Lord, you would deliver today from these ailments and illnesses. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, God, that your word says we can come boldly to the throne of grace where your mercy pours out upon us 
We thank you, Father, for what you're doing in bodies right now, in minds right now. Lord, we thank you, God, for the healing, Lord. God, we lift up right now Mari's family, Lord, that you just be with them, comfort them today. Comfort them today. Be with Laura and Craig, God. Strengthen them. God, I thank you for the legacy that Mari and Gail have left and pointing us to heaven and showing how to love one another here and to treat each other with the love of Christ and to serve. I pray, God, you would comfort the family. Lord, may they be at peace knowing he's in your hands in such a better place now. Thank you, God. And Lord, help us not to look at our lives from our perspective. Help us to have kingdom perspective. Help us to see what you see in us. You see an army of witnesses. You see an army of changed lives by the gospel. God, you're not looking at our education. You're not looking at our inadequacies. Lord, you're looking more so at our potential because you see the Holy Spirit living in our lives. And God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit fills in the gaps. In the places that we're inadequate, you are adequate. Where we're insufficient, your grace is sufficient. And we don't have to be afraid to speak out and to tell our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers what Jesus has done in our lives. We thank you, God, that right now we live in a society where I can talk about Jesus on the sidewalk. I can talk about Jesus in a break room. I can talk about Jesus in a school. I can talk about Jesus in, in college. God, give us the boldness through your spirit. So we're asking now too for the baptism, the filling of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, when we get alone with you, would you fill us? Would you fill us with your presence, Lord? And Lord, may we step out in faith and trust you to give us the words to say. And Lord, may we step out in faith in such a way that we don't prepare our entire lives to the point that we never do it. But I pray, God, that we would put perfection aside and 100% preparation to the side. And, and instead of trying to control or be adequate, we would trust in the Holy Spirit to lead and be our adequacy to give us what we need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, you've done that in my life, Lord. I haven't arrived, there's no way. I'll never arrive. I need your Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters in this room need your Holy Spirit. God, help us to depend on you. Help us to start and not even stop before we start. And God, help us to not let our fears silence us, to not let opposition or the devil silence us. But Lord, I echo those words. I can't stop talking about what I have seen and heard. I'll raise a hallelujah. A thousand hallelujahs. You have done it, Lord. And you want to use me. You want to use my brothers and sisters in this room. You want to use kids, teenagers, young adults, adults. You want to use us all. We thank you, Lord. God, help us to leave here knowing that you are with us by your spirit. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in this community, in this church, or through this church, in this community, God. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.